to start with framing it. Here's the space we're going to go after, and the frame has four parts. The last thing we're going to do is to have you pick an issue that you need to debate, a decision inside your organization, and I want you to frame it. And the framing starts with a question. All debate starts with a question. Here's where I see a lot of debates go wrong. How many times do you find yourself debating a topic? You can't debate a topic. Well, how many times do you find yourself debating and you don't even know what the topic is? We cannot debate a topic. We discuss topics. We debate questions. It's got to start with a question. It's the first test. If you do not know what the question is, you are not having a debate. You're just having a crazy discussion. Um, it starts with a question. Why? Why is this in question important? What is the imperative for why this needs to happen now? Who is involved? How's that decision going to make? And what data do you need? I'd like to suggest that everyone take the next three minutes, pick a decision that's high stakes in your organization where you could play the role of debate maker and frame it. What's the issue? And just fill in maybe, you know, the question, why, who, how, and what data do you need? I'm going to ask somebody to come up here and give us a quick framing of a debate. Does that make sense? You know you're done with this when you can articulate and kick off a debate. OK, we are just going to take one question. Who has a question that they need to go back and have debated on their team that they want to share with us? We're going to do a little on-the-spot coaching in that. We're going to take your question, and we're going to give you some feedback on, is this a really interesting debate question? Who's got one for us? And I'll come to you. You don't have to come up here. OK, over here. Now. Here's the test that I want everyone to think about as we're listening to John's debate question. I want to know, is this question clear? And is it interesting? Like, do you want to now put all of your brain power behind this question, OK? okay. So give us your question. OK, I, I'm John Ratliff from Apple Tree Answers. Our entire call center messaging answering service business is geared around one vendor and their platform. And the question is, is that vendor and that platform the right vendor and platform to take us to the next level and through the next five to 10 years? OK, good. Is this a question you can debate? Is this vendor the right one to take us over the next 10 years? It can be answered in a yes and no. You can take sides on this, can't you? Is it interesting? Is it high stakes? Do I understand why? Okay, an interesting debate question. I would love it if we had the time that we could go do a whole bunch of these, but I don't have. John, that's a great question for debate. We do well with questions that. <laughs> we like to debate questions that are interesting, that spark intellectual curiosity. We've got just a few minutes left. Um, and I just want to leave with a couple thoughts about how someone becomes more of a multiplier. How do you get all of the intelligence and capability outside of your organization? How do you lead with these disciplines? I'm going to share a video clip from Bill Campbell. I don't know if everyone here knows who Bill Campbell is. He's kind of a behind the scenes guy in Silicon Valley. He is the former CEO of Intuit Corporation, makes TurboTax, Quicken, et cetera. When I went to interview him, he said, Liz, I know you're claiming I'm a multiplier, but I started my career as one of the great diminishers of all time. And the journey is from diminisher to multiplier to multiplier of multipliers. Bill Campbell has retired from his CEO job, and he spends his days as the advisor to um, Larry, Sergey, and Eric at Google, to Steve Jobs. He is the behind-the-scenes coach to Steve, to Mark Andreessen, to Ben Horowitz, to um, Jeffrey Bezos. He is the person that's brought in to help these young founders learn how to grow a whole organization and not just rely on their sole genius. And I'll show the, at least the beginnings of this clip. This is Bill talking about his journey from diminisher to multiplier. In my early days in management, you know, I, you know, I, I, I came from a background where 
uh, you know, football, the, the more you knew, the better you were. And I think what you do in the situations that you're in with your management, you want to show everybody that you know everything. And so what you do is you kind of dominate the conversations, you tell people what you think, and, and you're not listening. And, and sooner or later it comes upon you that, you know, I'm really screwing this thing up. I'm not getting the best ideas from the best people. And I think over a long period of my early career, as I look back on it, uh, you know, I was one of the great diminishers of all time. When, when, uh, when I was at, at Apple, I was a diminisher, and yet, you know, Donna Dominski, Randy Commissar, they really wanted to come and, and, and start a brand new venture with me, and we had a lot of fun. We were always close and good friends. And, you know, they felt like at the end of my Apple time, I was getting somewhat better. And when I went to Claris and we started it, I went back to the same old way, you know, dominating conversations, telling people what to do, making a lot of the decisions in the staff meetings. And, you know, we had a brilliant management team, you know, you know people that, I mean, just, you know, you look at people that the caliber of Donna Dubinsky and Randy Commissar and the rest of them, you know, Yogan Dalal, Dan McCann, a lot of people that were like that. And so they, Donna was sent to me as an emissary from the group and sat down with me one late one afternoon and said, you're back to your old ways. You're not letting us do the jobs that we were hired to do. If we can't participate with you, then it's not going to be any fun being here. If you're going to make every decision and manage everything yourself, then we're never going to, this company's never going to be great and we're never going to enjoy it. Whew, what a, you know, what a blast. And, and it was one of those things that you, when you went home that night, you recognized, God, she did me a great favor, and I really had to go about making a behavior change. And, and, you know, today, I, I, I don't believe I'm like that at all. Um, you know, it, but you know, it, it didn't just happen overnight. You know, you needed to con be constantly reminded that uh, you have a tendency to, to try to provide your knowledge and your expertise in the situation and not listen to people who really had either different ideas or even more capable, way more capable than you are at certain functions. I had to become a multiplier. Not an easy transition, but, you know, I, I've made it. And, you know, today, what because it's such a revelation for me and in terms of me, you know, delegating and listening to management teams, I've spent a lot of my time coaching young companies and making sure they understand the concept. So the question that we ask when we hear Bill talk about starting his career as a diminisher and moving to becoming a multiplier is this transition happened for him organically over time. It happened over 20 years. Can it be sped up? Do you have to wait 20 years to really lead like a multiplier? We think the answer is yes. There are certain things people can do. What was the first step that Bill took? He learned to listen. He learned to listen to the genius and the ideas of people around him. If you ask what is Bill Campbell's reputation in Silicon Valley, he appreciates the ideas of the engineers around him. It's what allowed him to build this great company and to become this advisor. It began with this very first step.